been to a Brisbane, Professor Mendoza, and I really hope you're enjoying being back in Australia where you've spent, as he told us, uh, as he told me, some time uh, working before in your PhD. So I hope it's fond memories and, and friendships that you're rekindling as you're back. Um, uh, as I'm sure you know, our custom is to do a welcome to country for events like these. So we're here on the traditional lands of the Turbul and Yagura people, and we pay respect to their elders, laws, customs and creation spirits. We recognize that these lands have always been places of teaching, research and learning. And of course, working in the field that we are, we have a particular responsibility to try to tackle the perpetuation of injustice that is happening already through algorithmic means. Just a few weeks ago, we had the report on the uh, suspect targeting management plan in New South Wales, which is an automated algorithmic system, which was disproportionately targeting Indigenous Australians and young people. So uh, Professor Hika, Associate Professor Hikar, uh, Hikaru Fabrino Mendonca is uh, an Associate Professor at the Political Science Department at the Federal University of Minas Gerais, I hope I pronounced that correctly, which is one of the biggest universities in Brazil, in Belo, Belo Horizonte. He is the coordinator of MAGEM, which is a research group on democracy and justice, and a fellow at the National Institute of Science and Technology for Digital Democracy. He's also on the National Council for Scientific and Technological Development as a researcher. He works with democratic theory, critical theory, contentious politics, and political communications. And what he's here to talk to us about today is one of the co-authors of uh, a new book, Algorithmic Institutionalism, The Changing Rules of Social and Political Life, which is published by the Oxford University Press. So many of us here and at the ADMS Centre and the Digital Media Research Centre here at QUT have been interested in what we've called uh, as a working label, Civic ADM. So it's really great to continue that discussion, which we really got going at a workshop last year in Melbourne. And so diving into Hikaru, Hikaru's work is the perfect way to do that. I'm also very pleased to introduce our discussant for today, who is Dr. Tegan Cohen. She is a research fellow here at QUT and an affiliate of the ADMS Center. She researches regulation and governance of AI, including the democratization of AI governance, particularly the development of legal rights and mechanisms for effective public participation and contestability. So with her experience in legal practice, government and academia and her research interest, she's really the perfect person um, to lead us and guide our discussion today with um, Hikaru. And on that note, I'm quite happy to hand over to Hikaru. Let's hear from him. Good morning, everyone. Um, uh, thank you again. It is a great honor to be here. And I would like to uh, express my gratitude to Henry Fraser, who has been so kind and thoughtful in organizing uh, all elements of this event uh, and <laughs> everybody that was invo involved in the organization and also uh, Tegan Cohen for the discussion afterwards. So uh, thank you. It's a great honor and pleasure to be here. So uh, I'm originally from democratic theory and I'm relatively new in the field of the debate on algorithms and on um, automated decision making. And, um, and so I'll be talking today about this, this book, its main argument, and uh, actually how we got to, to this book, which was uh, actually uh, triggered by the preoccupations of a colleague, who is Virgilio Almeida, working in computer science and work and concerned with some of the developments of uh, AI uh, in Brazil and worldwide, obviously, and uh, willing to discuss and to comprehend how we could make sense of those things in terms of democratic theory. And so that's how we, we ended up with the book, which was published in December of 2023, and it's co-authored by Fernando Filgueiras and Virgilio Almeida and myself, uh, the three of us from Brazil, the different institutions. So, uh, so as a democratic theorist and as a political scientist, uh, I was often struck by, by, by the growing attention in political science uh, to algorithms, but pretty much restricted to specific uses of algorithms, specifically in social media. So preoccupations regarding the fragmentation of the public sphere or issues like polarization, disinformation and denialism, or the presence of bots when we talk about uh, public debate and everyday conversations and, and social interactions. So this has been pretty much covered in political science. 
but there was not so much attention to uh, the deeper and uh, broader elements of uh, algorithmic societies. So, and this is obviously very uh, <laughs> uh, everyday conversations for a group like this. But when we talk about algorithms, we depend on algorithms for a growing number of things. We could talk about urban mobility and how we move around cities, talk about relationships and the way that algorithms now have to map who we are supposed to desire and who is supposed to retribute this desire and how this changed drastically in relations of sociability and of affection and construction of emotions. We could pay attention to the definition of worksheets and schedules and the implications that algorithms are having in terms of uh, uh, policies of care, or welfare policies, the organization of everyday life and the routines uh, of workers uh, in big companies. But think about the access to welfare policies, and this has uh, had tremendous impacts. For instance, when I think about uh, COVID and the need to build really quick responses in terms of welfare policies in the middle of a pandemic, uh, medical decisions and the long-standing debate on the waiting list for transplants, uh, but also the famous work on the, the racial bias uh, that marked the access to uh, intensive care in American hospitals and how this has implications in terms of uh, very basic political issues, because in the bottom, politics is always about life and death. And so algorithms and automated decision making is obviously uh, on the ground of these decisions that are defining the chances of life and death of uh, billions of people every day. And the, 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 the most famous examples probably the uh, predicted policy and criminal dosimetry in terms of uh, the decisions affecting uh, how law is enforced and how uh, the police works. So looking at these examples and others, uh, we, we wrote the book uh, with a specific conceptual proposition, which is to, first of all, and acknowledging that algorithms are socio-technical artifacts that structure our decision-making capacity. But the argument of the book is that uh, we often think of how algorithms are changing institutions, but we could think of them as institutions. So algorithms as institutions that establish boundaries for individual behaviors with collective implications. Algorithms as institutions that set contexts in which we interact with other uh, algorithms and with other human beings and with other beings, broadly speaking, in order to, um, to, 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 to take decisions. And how these, uh, this context defined by the, whose boundaries are established through algorithmic decision making, uh, uh, are in a certain way constraining and enabling forms of individual behavior at the same time uh, that, they are, that they have collective and social implications with deep political uh, consequences. So the book attempts to do a dual movement between institutional theories and algorithmic societies, paying attention to what are the responses in non-institutional theories that may help us make sense of algorithms and their political and social implications. And on the same, uh, on the other hand, how can algorithms help us to rethink to, uh, our institutional theories and to make sense of them and to change uh, basic concepts in, in institutional theories? So what do we understand as institutions? And this is a very basic definition from a classic uh, Martin Olson paper that redefines what new institutionalism meant. Uh, and so, an and this is a quote, an institution is a relatively enduring collection of rules and organized practices embedded in the structures of meaning and resources that are relatively invariant in the face of turnover of individuals and relatively resilient to the idiosyncratic preferences and expectations of individuals and changing external circumstances. So when we look at this definition of institutions, which is often applied to uh, political institutions or to broad social institutions, but the basic definition is enduring collections of rules that organize practices that have consequences over behaviors and that are relatively stable and invariant. Although there's, and this is a key point of the book, a lot of work on institutional theories in order to understand how these relatively enduring collection of rules change over time and how do they uh, uh, acquire new shapes and forms. So. By, by this broad and basic definition of institutions, 
we can delve into institutional theories and look at what institutions can actually do because institutions they empower and constrain so they enable specific forms of action at the same time that they constrain and, and forbid or hinder certain forms of behavior institutions also reduce the flexibility and variability of possibilities and of choices available to actors institutions shape political actions by advancing logics of appropriate behavior so what is uh, induced what is allowed what is stimulated and incentivated and what is actually to be um, hindered or uh, prohibited and institutions establish authorities with decision-making prerogatives uh, entities that are allowed to take decisions about certain things in certain circumstances and if you think about algorithms again they have all these functions and capacities when we think about how they frame and act upon our everyday interactions in many circumstances and in many ways so in the book we basically went to different traditions of institutionalism and this is very controversial in political science because these traditions are very different uh, they uh, authors sometimes have really different uh, understandings assumptions regarding what an institution is and how it should be uh, conceived of but we draw from these and so in the book we discuss these four perspectives on institutional theories so first rational choice institutionalism which basically thinks about institutions as ways uh, to rationalize behavior and to make it more stable over time and to make forms of collective action possible despite the tendencies of humans to go in different directions and not to work together and to cooperate so institutions have a specific function of rationalizing human decision making and in rational choice institutionalism you also pay attention to how uh, individuals interact with these institutions how they make choices how they uh, take decisions within the boundaries established by the rules um, governing uh, specific sets of, of, of interaction sociological institutionalism has a broader conception of institutions it's more concerned with meanings and it's more concerned with uh, the, the, the construction and development of institutions that do not necessarily have a function in rationalizing our interactions we arrive at institutions for several reasons and uh, so institutional isomorphism has a key role in here so that uh, in certain circumstances institutions just are derived from others and from tradition and from uh, historical developments and they may lead to very rational consequences in certain ways but uh, sociological institutionalism is concerned with how institutions affect each other in the construction of broader fields of institutions historical institutionalism pays attention to the macro perspective and to, uh, to to how institutions evolved to how institutions transformed and to their historical groundedness and more specifically to 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 institutional change that ha can happen in several ways but more specifically to critical junctures so specific situations that can lead to very different directions and to path dependency and path dependence was a key element for us to pay attention to algorithms once we are uh, we were concerned with in democratic terms how algorithms can crystallize quote unquote in a certain way um, through feedback loops forms of decision making leaving uh, little space little room for actual change for actual reflexivity which is a key element if you think in democratic terms so uh, so the idea of path dependency that is so strong when we think about predictive policy for instance which when we think about algorithmic racism when we think about the racial bias so all these elements that are at the heart of uh, democratic concerns regarding algorithmic systems and algorithmic assemblages broadly speaking and discursive institutionalism the fourth tradition to which we paid attention to uh, has to do with the central role of meaning and of ideas in defining institutions and how institutions frame contacts and how uh, these frames are a, a part a big part of how we behave 
and uh, how we build society uh, along these, these institutions. So based on these four traditions and recognizing, acknowledging the, the fundamental differences in terms of premises and assumptions, what we try to do is to offer an analytical framework which we would then apply to different layers of uses of algorithmic systems. So we built an, algorithm, uh, an analytical framework with six dimensions, and we believe that these six dimensions help us to make sense of how algorithmic systems work uh, in different set settings and contexts. So we, in the book, we had devoted a chapter to um, security assemblages, to facial recognition, predictive policing, uh, lethal autonomous weapons, and uh, 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 this broader ap application, operationalization of algorithmic systems. We devoted a chapter to the platformization of governments and specifically uh, the use of algorithms in, in welfare policies. And uh, another chapter to uh, recommendation systems. There is an overlap be because obviously recommendation systems are part of all of them, but we wanted to argue that the framework is capable of looking to very specific algorithms and to broader areas and topics and algorithmic assemblage in order to, to, to make sense of the political and social implications of um, algorithmic systems. So what is this analytical framework? So we, we, we claim that in order to analyze algorithms through uh, institutional theories, we must uh, start by looking at institutional construction and design. As it has always been the case when I think about institutions. So how were these institutions built? What were the intentions on the base of this institution? How the, these intentions were crossed by several other forms of agency, including in this case, other algorithmic systems and human action, broadly speaking. So what were the interests? What were the uh, processes that led to the construction of these specific algorithms or to these broader algorithmic systems? The second dimension is history. And we want to think about critical junctures, specific moments in which there is space and there is room for choice and the path dependency cutting across algorithms and the, the, the everyday use of algorithms. The third uh, dimension is rules and norms and which is central to any institutional analysis. So uh, what are the rules and norms generated by the existence of these specific algorithmic systems? What kind of behaviors are being induced and constrained? What kind of affordances are there in these specific algorithms leading to certain forms of behavior and constraining other forms of behavior? And what are the collective consequences, if we think in broader terms, of the inducement of certain forms of behavior instead of others? The fourth dimension is obviously coming from political science, the power implication of algorithmic systems. So uh, what sorts of uh, uh, power relationships are being induced by the existence of these algorithmic systems? What forms of injustice and oppression are being nurtured by the, the way that these algorithms are working and by the way that we, uh, in, that we are actually uh, building on the basis of certain algorithmic systems. But we also believe that uh, an institutional reading of algorithms requires paying, paying attention to gaming. And um, I'm particularly concerned with forms of resistance to uh, power relationships enacted by algorithms. So uh, what are the everyday ways in which we interact with algorithmic systems in order to resist to their power, to change the way they act, and to uh, promote other forms of, uh, of relationships. What are the forms of organization, lobbying, social movements, uh, attempts to regulate, and everyday attempts of resistance, for instance, to disidentify ourselves. And we use the work of Jacques Rancière to talk about these specific attempts to disidentify uh, ourselves in the face of algorithms in order to resist to the to power relations uh, nurtured by, by algorithmic systems. And the last dimension is the discursive dimension of our algorithm. So coming from a background of deliberative democracy, which pretty much pays attention to discourses, uh, we can think about how algorithms, algorithms are discourses in the public sphere. 
these courses expressed in a different way, coded, that express positions, values, and that have actual implications in terms of how we engage in several situations and how we make sense of several situations. But besides looking at algorithms as arguments, we can also look at the arguments around algorithms and pay attention to the public debate. And for instance, uh, the, the past year has uh, watched and witnessed an enormous discussion around uh, specific applications of artificial intelligence and radical changes in terms of how the public makes sense and uh, gets concerned and discuss uh, some of the implications of, of of applications of artificial intelligence, for instance. We believe that uh, the approach allows navigating certain dichotomies that have been quite strong if we think about the field of technology studies. So it helps us to think about algorithms uh, neither as fully autonomous anemic agents but nor as simply neutral tools that can be used in whatever direction. So as any other institutions, algorithms are built through human interaction and through other forms of agency uh, agencies interacting, and they shape context in which we act, uh, uh, acting upon us, but also responding to our agency in very complex ways. And that's why it also helps to overcome the dichotomy between structure and agency. Algorithms are simultaneously structuring the context in which we act, uh, but suffering our agency and retroacting upon us in terms of inducing and constraining our behaviors. And for this way, we can also think about how it helps us to overcome the dichotomy between determinism and openness. So there are strong determining. Um, elements in how algorithms operate and if you think about path dependency that's particularly uh, relevant uh, but we don't like to think about them in terms of uh, only determinism because they are also inter interacting in situations in which uh, they lead to possibilities of openness and of creativity and of co-production that can lead in different directions and that can be reinvented which is not a naive way of thinking about them because obviously these opening possibilities are also profoundly and deeply marked by all the power relationships in which they are embedded, obviously. Okay. And then we move to the final part of the book, the, 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 the final chapter, which is, um, so how do we think about these algorithmic systems in terms of uh, democracy? And there is a, a big discussion and a big trend contemporarily in terms of epistocracy and how epistocratic forms of government are uh, being proposed even by scholars like Jason Brennan and that, are, uh, and that are part of the public debate. If you think about public policy based in evidence, for instance, and the seduction of uh, applying artificial intelligence to every decision making and of depoliticizing allegedly decision making through automated decision making. So there is this trend and there is this fascination with the possibilities of overcoming politics in times in which we have simultaneously very polarized forms of politics and attempts to adopt technic uh, technicizing discourses to overcome uh, politics allegedly, obviously. And, uh, and our argument is obviously against the epistocratic tendencies that are a key component when we think about democratic erosion and to think about possibilities of democratization of algorithms. Of algorithms. Because if uh, institutions are confusing and opaque, like algorithms, they have ambivalent consequences and they are pervaded by deep power symmetry in games. But if they may foster epistocratic values, and we believe that they have been fostering for the past few years, we may as well seek to bring them closer to democratic values. And I think that we are at one point in which this has at least become a concern for several reasons and with ambivalent consequences, but uh, the, the need to democratize uh, algorithmic systems is at least uh, part of the public discourse at the moment. So in the book we discuss basically uh, the, the, the relevance of certain values uh, in order to think about the possibility of democratization of algorithms. 
So we discussed the need for participation for multi-stakeholder forms of participation and discussion of algorithms. And they obviously interact with the, the, the values here. Uh, and there are some propositions nowadays with also ambivalent consequences in terms, for instance, of generating a world citizens assembly around uh, artificial intelligence. That's uh, London Moore's argument, for instance, in terms of how do we promote forms of participation to deal with the political and social implications of algorithms. Well, it's also essential to, to think in terms of equality. Uh, and equality here obviously means the need to involve different voices in how we think about the democratization of algorithms. Not only big tech companies, not only experts, not only scientists, but uh, people that are in a certain way affected by algorithms, which basically means everybody in their very basic needs, needs in their everyday lives. But when I think in terms of equality, it also means taking seriously the unequal consequences of algorithms. And I would rather not talk about bias here. Uh, we don't think that bias is the problem of algorithms. We may need it. We may need, I'm sorry, biased algorithms to deal with forms of inequality. We may need to address forms of inequality through bias algorithms that actually help to promote equality. And I think that if we expect algorithms just to treat everybody equally all the time, we may be also reinforcing forms of inequality on an everyday basis. So some of the discussions around the, the problem of bias may be misleading if we think in broader terms of equality and democracies. Thirdly, pluralism, and it's pretty much related to uh, to, to the first point on participation, the need for different voices, but also the implications that some algorithmic systems have in terms of hindering the existence of pluralism in society and the existence of different points of view that are capable of interacting with each other. So how do we deal with the consequences of these algorithms? And this obviously leads to the fourth uh, value, which is accountability and transparency. And this is a very broad and uh, topic when we think about democratization of algorithms and there is this belief sometimes that if you open up the black box and if you see the code you have a transparent algorithm and you'll be able to deal with that so we argue that it's obviously more complicated than that because underneath the surface you may have another layer of the surface that it's not entirely known uh, because algorithmic systems are interacting with other algorithmic systems and with individuals in very complex ways and computer science often refer to artificial intelligence as a form of alchemy that it's not fully known and anticipated beforehand so thinking about transparency and accountability in terms simply of uh, showing the code and of making the code apparent may not deliver the democratic needs for the democratization of algorithm of algorithms Sorry, the English here sometimes, and I apologize for the <laughs> algorithmic systems and algorithms, and <laughs> I apologize. But so the argument here goes that we should pay attention to um, output uh, of algorithms and to the consequences. And then more than uh, understanding the code in itself, we should be paying more attention to their consequences and discussing accountability and responsibility on the grounds of the of output uh, legitimacy of the of, of the consequences of these algorithmic systems. Public debate, which is uh, central value for democracy, and uh, specifically if we think uh, how much energy and time and topics have been devoted, and in several places and countries, and we are discussing in Brazil now. Uh, proposal to regulate artificial intelligence that it's basically I would say the result of the bus around chat GPT and its capacity to uh, set an agenda and uh, point to certain preoccupations and worries in terms of uh, what can be the consequences and results and this seems to be happening everywhere so this critical ambivalent critical juncture that may lead to forms of regulation uh, that are not necessarily good 
uh, that may be bad, <laughs> like any form of regulation, but that make us think and make sense of, uh, of algorithmic systems. And at last, freedom. And freedom is obviously a central element of democracies. But freedom is also a central element when we think about algorithms. First, and if we divide freedom from and freedom to, uh, which is a classic distinction in political philosophy, so algorithms have broad implications in terms of freedom from, in terms of if you think about uh, surveillance capitalism and the forms of monitoring systems and how we are, we have become more transparent to states and how our steps are trackable to corporations and to the states and how uh, these may point to several forms of constraints. Specifically, we think, if we think about uh, the rise of authoritarian regimes. So um, I come from Brazil and obviously uh, the discussion around uh, Pegasus, for instance, and the acquisition of certain devices that could allow uh, 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 a specific government to uh, on the brinks of democratic erosion and fostering uh, democratic erosion all the time. And I refer here to the Bolsonaro government, uh, how uh, the use of technologies in order to monitor citizens and, op uh, I would say opponents, but they actually were monitoring their allies as well, <laughs> which actually made it more visible and it's <laughs> kind of good in a certain way. Uh, but uh, how this ha can have severe implications and how this should be a central concern if you think about the democratization of algorithms. And at this, uh, on the other hand, uh, if you think in terms of freedom to uh, how algorithmic systems can be quite dangerous in terms of hindering autonomous forms of action in terms of forms of manipulation, in terms of the inducement of certain behaviors. I do not want to uh, neglect the potential of agency in human beings because this is my field and I'm particularly concerned with resistance. Uh, but uh, there are obvious implications in terms of autonomous action when I think about uh, democracies. And this has been a central issue in uh, elections and all around the world. So yeah, so uh, we don't have clear responses. I don't believe anybody has a clear response on how to uh, regulate, democratize algorithmic systems. But we believe that going back to democratic theory and to institutional theory and to make sense of how other institutions that would not be democratic, think about how parliament became democratic, that would be inconceivable. Parliaments are not fully democratic. I'm not saying that they are full of problems in terms of when we think about democratic values. But in the same way that very complex institutions have been at least dealt with from democratic lenses and from institutional lenses, we can make sense and think about algorithms through these lenses. So this is a QR code of an open access uh, chapter six, which is the chapter that discusses democracy and algorithms. Uh, it is open access until this Friday by, by Oxford University Press. If you're interested, I can also send afterwards the, the, the link to, to, to chapter six. And thank you.